So the, uh, this next group that we're going to look at are called the nematodes, uh, which are the round ones. And I'll mention sort of why, why I'm including them next. Uh, it just has to do with the simple progression of the study of uh, the animal body wall structure. And as it gets a little bit more complex, um, if we look at cladistic analysis based on molecular data, and depending on the genes that were chosen, there's a whole variety of different um, placements, you know, of where of the, where the nematodes might go. Uh, so this is just kind of more of the a older traditional look, um, but in keeping with the theme of looking at um, comparing actual structures and progressing along from more simple to more complex, this group fits in here. Um, and traditionally, it, it did fit in at this location now because of all reasons I'll talk about. Um, it's been moved around and, and there, there's also a number of other groups um, similar to this one uh, and that they're all called collectively Ascomenthes, um, which is was a phyla and then has been broken into many, many different phyla. A lot of small microscopic uh, animals. So they're multicellular, but they're microscopic. Um, and they share a lot of common uh, features, but we're not going into them in this class in a zoology course or invertebrate zoology course. Again, you would go through probably all those groups or at least mention them. Um, but here we're just kind of sticking with about the 10 major uh, phyla. One of the reasons why then we're bringing this particular group in is it is likely one of the most uh, abundant animal groups. So as far as all, all the animals go on the planet, you could potentially find more nematodes, you know, per square meter than any other type of animal. In fact, um, in some uh, surveys done of sediments, there are over uh, one million per uh, square meter. And in some sediments, some marine sediments, uh, they've been found to be over four million individuals in a square meter. Right. So these are small organisms, typically. Uh, there some can get large, but uh, generally those are some of the parasites. Mostly all the free-living organisms, and we'll talk about their lifestyles. Um, free-living organisms are usually very small, often even microscopic uh, little worms. Many of them live in the soil. Okay, so they will often live in soil, and they're actually incredibly important for um, soil nutrient recycling and aeration of soil. So often we think about uh, things like earthworms. We think about worms in the soil and soil health, and, and they do certain things, uh, recycling in soil and aeration. But the nematodes do arguably even more and are even more important for um, soil health uh, and the, the nutrient cycling in the soils. So um, they're very important um, free living organisms, but they're also well known as being parasites uh, as well. So they're parasites. Uh, of, so also parasites of uh, both plants and animals. So they parasitize vertebrate and invertebrate animals as well as, as plants. Uh, but then the many of them live in the soil, they're free living. There's about, about say 200,000 species K for, for 1,000. Uh, 200,000 species described roughly, but it's estimated you know, 20 uh, times more than that potentially exist that have been you know, undescribed. So um, probably millions of, of different species uh, of nematodes that are, that are not known. So one, uh, a lot of species. Two, uh, extreme, extremely abundant group. Uh, three, very important group of organisms uh, for both soil, nutrient cycling, and also then uh, medically as parasites. Our focus now is going to be just on, on structure. So if we look at the structure uh, of a nematode, it's actually in some ways uh, fairly simple. On the outside of the organism, we have a cuticle. Uh, a cuticle typically made up of uh, collagen. Right? There are some different types of biochemical makeups of some of the different uh, cuticles. Now, this 
what does it mean to be a cuticle? It means it's a, it's a layer on the outside of the organism that is secreted by the epidermis. So inside uh, the cuticle then is the epidermis. We ha this is kind of where the relationship of this organism uh, is under potentially some debate and, and re rearrangement uh, and, and deviation from uh, tradition. So um, some organisms have a, an outer covering, a cuticle. Some animals right, do this. Some have a very unique and complex layer called an exoskeleton, which is uh, the group called the arthropods, which we'll get into in a, in a short while. Um, and they then molt that exoskeleton. It's a process called ecdysis, which we'll go into in a little bit of detail in this course. Um, that over time as the animal grows, essentially this is a non-living outer layer. So think about your, say your fingernails, okay? Different types of material uh, that makes them, but um, it's a non-living layer secreted by the living cells, the, the epidermis, all right? Uh, and what happens is as the, this is like a shell in a way around the organism. If the organism's tissues are gonna grow and the organism's gonna get bigger, that layer typically doesn't grow in this particular case. They have to get rid of it or molt it. And that's kind of where, and that process is called ecdysis. And there's a whole group of organisms called the ectozoans. So it's any organism that molts a, an outer cuticle. Um, and the idea is that that process only potentially evolved once. Now, the thing is, these cuticles that are being discussed in that, um, many of them are made of completely different materials. Um, the organisms themselves, their body arrangements, their structures, um, segments or not segments, uh, tissues, organs and organ systems are all completely different and all over the place. Um, yet for that one reason alone, certain people have chosen to clump them all together as one group. Uh, and so that makes discussing them uh, and, and learning about their anatomy very different because they're all completely different. Um, so again, the, the focus here is we're stuck focusing on structures uh, as we progress along the way, and then mentioning that the actual relationships among the organisms um, is something that's constantly kind of being re reassessed or changing. So we have the nematodes here. Um, they have this cuticle uh, that protects them from the environment. In addition to that, it's going to protect them against um, their own internal pressure. So it's something we'll, we'll get into as we talk about this cavity here. So this is a secreted outer layer. It can be shed uh, as the animal grows. There's an epidermis, and then there's a muscular layer uh, beneath that, uh, and this is longitudinal muscle. And this is significant that it's longitudinal muscle. So the, it's muscle that runs, you know, the length, the fibers run along the length of the animal's body, like this, the longitudinal muscle. There's no circular muscle. So in the platyhelminthes, we had um, circular muscle wrapping around the organism, so contracting and kind of squeezing the animal together, and then longitudinal muscle, which would then uh, contract and also shorten the animal. They only have longitudinal, which is kind of peculiar because we said uh, previously they kind of counteract one another um, in, in their uh, contractions. So what happens here is this, this internal cavity is full of fluid. So this is a you know, fluid-filled cavity. And if you remember, um, in a previous lecture, I mentioned a term called the hydro... Oh, we use a different marker because this one is uh, having trouble writing some, but it's called our hydrostatic skeleton. And that's just a generic term, and a lot of groups of organisms have what's called a hydrostatic skeleton. So essentially that means a chamber cavity of the body that becomes full of fluid. The cavity is either permanently closed or can be closed at some point in time, so the volume remains the same. And that way when the organism contracts tissues, like muscle, they're contracting against that volume. It is not compressible. That volume is going to stay the same, and it's going to push back against the muscle. So it's acting as a skeletal support structure and a, and a counter to the muscular contraction. This chamber, this fluid-filled cavity, uh, is referred to as the pseudoseal.
Now, so when we call this this group and a number of other groups that have a cavity kind of like this, pseudo coelomates. So pseudo means false or, or fake uh, coelom, and that's the the coelom. And so remember we said the coelom is a body cavity. So in us, uh, the coelom, our coelom, is the cavity where our lungs and heart and other organs are held. And then we have another tube running through uh, our bodies, which does, and, and they do as well, which is the intestines. So the digestive cavity, and that would be this little tube here, kind of running through the animal's body. Now, something, well, I'll get back to the cavity in just a second. Something to keep in mind about this group, they have a complete digestive system. which means mouth at one end, anus at the other, so food will come in through the mouth, travel through the intestines, and then exit. Uh, so that's kind of unique. So that's kind of a stepwise progression from the you know sponges having a sponge seal doing completely cellular digestion. The cnidarians then having the cilenteron, so their gut cavity, which can open and close, but it's a blind gut, so food comes in, and then it has to come back out the same opening. The... Flatworms having a much more complex branched gut structure, um, but still typically a blind gut. Uh, and now we have a complete digestive system area in this group. So kind of stepwise, you know, sort of in progression of that system. So the rest of this is full of fluid, the rest of this whole cavity. And you can see that there's uh, mesodermal tissue. So remember, muscle is derived from mesoderm. So remember, we have our ectoderm our mesoderm, and our endoderm. Endoderm gives rise to the gut. Ectoderm gives rise to the skin and nervous system. And then mesoderm will give rise to muscle and organs. And that's generic. Uh, there's more details to that, obviously, but that's all kind of where we are right now anyway. Uh, as far as what the organisms even have. So a true coelom, a true coelom is a body cavity that is completely lined by mesoderm. So that would mean that there's mesodermal tissue, muscle tissue, say, on the outside, and there's mesodermal or muscle tissue on the inside. So what's lacking here, what's missing to make this a pseudo seal, not a true coelom, is to be a true coelom, we would need muscle around the digestive cavity. And we don't have that. So this is not a true coelom, so it's just a body cavity full of fluid. Um, it's a coelom-like cavity, but we call it, uh, refer to it as the pseudo seal. Its significance is that it provides a great amount of pressure. So much pressure. The pseudo seal, so this is water pressure, or fluid pressure, pushing on the outer body wall then it makes these organisms almost perfectly round. So it's kind of where the name round worms come from, if we were to look at them, uh, because of the internal pressure from this cavity pushing outward. The purpose of that pressure is kind of acting as a skeletal structure in support of or in, in uh, counter to the contraction of the muscle. When these animals move, they move in more of a sinusoidal way where they're uh, contracting longitudinal muscles so the muscles are contracting you know, and shortening. And then these muscles on this side are being stretched. And they can do this sort of in waves along the body. So here, these are now being stretched, whereas these are contracting. Uh, and it kind of then makes the animal move in a sort of a wave-like fashion. They move through typically uh, in just regular water, they can't move all that well. Uh, so usually they're in some kind of solid. So that's why they're in soils or they're in tissues. And then that movement helps propel them uh, as they move uh, through those environments. So we said up front, they do have a mouth where they can feed and bring in their food as they move. So some of them might eat uh, bacteria uh, or other small uh, single-celled uh, organisms um, that might consume find sediment particles, you know, as well. Um, and then the parasites will be feeding on tissues of their host organisms as well, and bringing that into their gut. If you're to dissect this organism and cut it open in a lab, which is sometimes fairly common, uh, one of the surprising things is, you know, because of this big pseudoseal without mesoderm, it's empty. 
right? Unless they're reproductively mature. Uh, and so you kind of have just this big internal cavity, and then you can see the digestive tract. The digestive tract in a dissected organism, sometimes hard to see because it's very flat. It's like a flat little ribbon just lying on, on the, the inside of the body wall. Um, it's very flimsy, or easy to, to, to break usually and damage um, because it doesn't have any muscle tissue you know, really associated with it. It's just the um, endodermally derived you know, gut itself. Um, the other thing you would probably see if you were to open up an organism in a lab is um, color this, uh, reproductive structures. So if you see other solid structures, so say in a cross section, so this is the cross section. Of the roundworm uh, and you see the gut in the middle. So that's the digestive cavity of the intestines. And then if you see other structures somewhere, depending on how many of them, depending on where you look at them and what the organism is, male or female, um, you might see many of these or only a few of these, but these other structures are all gonna be reproductive structure. So they could be um, containing sperm or egg or duct type structure um, that's kind of holding them or transporting them, but that's typically what they are. If you were to open up the organism again, I said in the lab, uh, if they were reproductively mature, what you would find is, you know, the whole internal structure has all these kind of twisty uh, little things that you might think is a digestive tract because they actually are fairly solid, but in fact, they're all reproductive structure. So pretty much that's the main thing you'll see inside the organism. They are separate sexes. with internal fertilization so they have to mate some of the organisms other organisms we've discussed so far they do they do what's called broadcast spawning so they release sperm and eggs into the environment and then fertilization occurs there and then the larvae develops so if you're going to have internal fertilization that means then you must find a mate uh, and, and actually then exchange um, the sperm uh, with them or the sperm in this particular case uh, if they're hermaphrodites they would just exchange sperm if they're male and female then obviously the the male is uh, injecting the sperm into the female and that's typically what happens here there aren't particular openings the male actually injects uh, the sperm into the female uh, and then they they go through their development once they reach this is another important or unique thing about this group once they embryos start to develop the cells start to divide they will eventually reach a, a terminal cell number. Okay, so that's what this term here means, utile. Means fixed cell number. So again, a bunch of these organisms that are pseudocelomates and part of this Ascomenthes group also share this feature. Uh, it means that when the organism reaches maturity, that the number of cells the organism has making up its body is fixed at a set number, like let's say 242 cells. And that's it. There's never 244 or six, or that's, there's just a very specific number of cells and that's all. If the organism continues to grow in size, the cells themselves become larger, but there's no more mitosis. There's no more cell division in the organism except for the cell division that takes place in the reproductive system to produce the gametes. But of the body cells, they never divide after they've reached maturity. Uh, so that's a unique characteristic and it's called utile. Um, most other organisms do not have that. There's no fixed number of cells that most other organisms have. They can continue to divide and make more and more cells. Cells die, they make more cells. Uh, they can grow and make more cells, but these organisms do not. Uh, and that's something that's also very unique about them. Um, I think if there's anything else I wanna talk about them, this, this, again, it's a, um, in some ways, this group is somewhat simplistic, but it's also very important um, because it's kind of an in-between of the, the more basic uh, diploblastic organisms or the organisms that don't have body cavities and a lot of organs and organ systems to the next groups that we start to talk about that are gonna have a lot more complexity to them. And that's gonna be because the complex internal structures are gonna be derived from the mesoderm. And once you have a cavity completely lined with mesoderm, you'll have different types of muscle, muscle, different types of connective tissue, different types of organs and organ systems developing, and a whole, a whole variety of different things. Last thing, I, I knew there was one more thing I was, I was uh, forgetting, is uh, the 
nervous system. What do they have? Um, they actually have running along the top and bottom, so a dorsal and ventral, so this may say belly side, ventral, top, you know, a back side is the dorsal, and these are nerve cords. And then there are lateral nerves that usually are much smaller that run along the sides. And then there are little loops that kind of connect them uh, along the way. So uh, around, running along the animal's body, they do have sort of like these nerve cords that run around like this. And the anterior region, so again, sort of where the mouth is, is our sort of head region. And again, the term for that is anterior. So that's head region. What we'll find here uh, is around the uh, digestive tract, I'm gonna make this a little bit larger to look it's outside the animal's body, but I have no real room to draw here. There's gonna be a nerve ring. So again, this is inside the animal's body. You know, it's here in the, in the cavity um, and it wraps around the digestive tract. And then branching off of that nerve ring is where we have the different uh, nerve cords kind of running through the animal's body. So keep in mind that they do have a kind of a concentration of uh, nerve cord and then ganglia. So those are again, concentrated nerve bundles um, all in this anterior region. So they don't have a brain, but kind of this is sort of the beginnings of developing a nervous system that kind of has a central processing unit uh, in one area, a brain, and then information that could be sent throughout the organism or picked up from places and sent back uh, so that they can alter their behavior and coordinate their, their movement. So they do kind of have that type of nervous system. And that's pretty much it that we're going to go into with the, the nematodes. Again, there, there's a lot we could go into with uh, parasitic life cycles and a variety of other things. But the main thing is uh, for you to know the tissue layers from a cross section and generally how the body is organized. Um, and then just a couple of the other details and the unique terms related to this particular group.